these guys want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with me and then uh, be able to say I'm crazy and then I'll have to give up control of uh, TWA to them. It's just... <laughs> I, well, maybe you'd teach them a lesson if you just gave it to them. Then they could sue me for a whole lot of money and then they may come after my daddy's company and so I, I really can't afford to let them make me some kind of a psychiatric case. I, I would leave this country and never come back. I'd leave this country and never come back. I'd leave this country and never come back, you know? I'd leave this country and never come back. Uh, that was a clip from Rules Don't Apply, and I'm delighted to be joined by the uh, producer, director, writer, and actor mm -hmm. in the film, uh, Mr. Warren Beatty. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for coming. Could you just set up the, the film for us? So we, it's 1958. 1958. The movie is very much about the consequences of what we would call American Protestant Puritanism uh, that so often has made us the laughingstock of uh, Europe and um, other places in the world. And um, these two religious young people, one from Virginia and another from Fresno, California, the, the, the boy, the, the girl is Lily Collins, and the boy is Alden Ehrenreich, who you pr probably... Uh, uh, no, he's the new Han Solo. Yes. And uh, they're really very, very um, talented, intelligent, tasteful actors. They're funny. These two kids come to Hollywood at the same time that I came in 1958 and cope with a business that is, uh, let us say, not opposed to the selling of certain eroticisms. And it is their Protestant Puritanism that is an obstacle in their relationship as is the presence of Howard Hughes, who, <laughs> who is a person that uh, I've always been amused by. It always kind of made me laugh, the stories that I would hear about him. I, I didn't feel that I could do this movie in any way other than mainly comedic. It's been in the back of my mind for quite some time to do a story that had to do with the American Puritanism that is um, gradually catching up with the rest of the world. This was set at the time that you first came uh, to Hollywood, uh, 1958, and you came from a similar background to Marla, the Marla character mm -hmm. in this, which is Virginia. And I just wondered whether when you arrived, what the difference, was there a difference in perception to what you thought Hollywood was going to be and what it was. How did you come up against those rules, I guess? I mean, your sister was there a couple of years before you. Yeah. Marla comes straight from Virginia to Hollywood. I went to Northwestern University for a year, and then I went to New York, and I played piano in a bar. I had the good luck of almost accidentally uh, meeting up with a, a wonderful teacher of acting, Stella Adler, and I began to see during the months that I was there that maybe I wouldn't go back to Northwestern University. So I had a, an interim period where I fell into what would have been called in those days the life of a New York actor as opposed to a Hollywood actor. And then I got very lucky. I did a play on Broadway, and Ilya Kazan saw me in the play, and then he uh, offered me this movie, and the movie was... Uh, I learned a tremendous amount about not only directing but producing and causing a movie to happen from uh, Kazan. And because the movie did well, then I got... I got quite lucky because then I didn't have to rush in and do one movie after another movie after another movie. So I've had the good fortune to be able to stop. I stopped making movies for a life of political activity. And I, and then when uh, Annette uh, Benning, my wife, and I had four kids, uh, that was more interesting than anything and more enjoyable and more meaningful to me than anything ever happened to me. Annette Benning um, is at the beginning of the film. I think Annette Benning should be at the beginning of every film. There's just I, I, yes. incredibly yeah. reassuring presence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's a wonderful actress and um, a wonderful wife and a wonderful mother to these kids. So I waited a long time to go into that life, and um, is uh, the most uh, meaningful thing that has ever uh, occurred for me. And uh, has that has that fed into the way that you make a, a movie now? Well, I guess everything feeds into the way a person works. I'm wondering how it does, I mean, other than, you know, casting your wife. I mean, for instance, when, when you were, uh, during the writing process, do you write at home or do you write 
in an office? Do you kind of leave the house to write? Or The writing process for me, I, I don't even know if I could legitimately call it a, a writing process. I would call it more a thinking process, a planning process, an imagining process. And then the putting together of a movie, I like to think, you know, there, it's a, a sort of an axiom that I think is very true that character is plot. But then particularly in a movie, casting is character. So casting becomes plot. So when the movie comes together, you see possibilities that one person could make clear in two or three shots and another person might need four pages of dialogue. So the writing of a movie, I think, takes place during the making of a movie. Does that mean you were rewriting once you'd cast or were you well, rewriting as you went uh, I, I feel that when we you are saying writing, uh, you're referring to paper. Script, and, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it continues. I think you have to pretty much decide where you're going to go with certain things because it becomes, it has financial repercussions if you don't know what you're doing. So I think the writing of the script is one phase of the writing and then... The shooting of the movie is another phase of the writing, and the editing is yet another phase of the writing. So I, I would say it ain't like writing a book. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important to begin with something that you think that's the way it's going to be, and then you, you realize again and again, no, it's not going to be exactly that way. And a lot of that comes from casting. I was going to ask you about the casting because uh, your two leads, Lily Collins and Alden Ehrenreich, they're great. I mean, they looked like they were of the time. I mean, they, with Lily Collins, there were times when she looked like a like Gene Simmons. I mean, there was a kind of, you know, there was that look that she had, which was kind of classic look that we associate with that time. Mm. What were you looking for in them and what do you think they brought to it? Did you consider lots of people, was it? Uh... Oh, yes, I did. But I also feel strongly about what is sometimes called the blink, that the immediate response on seeing someone, meeting someone, or the immediate response in dealing with an issue in which the unconscious gives you your opinion rather than when you try to brilliantly sit around and think about it more and more and more all the time getting dumber. Uh, on, about the whatever it is you've been thinking about applies. So uh, the blink on, on meeting with Lily was immediate and the same thing with Alden. And then the more I met with him and the more that I talked to them reinforced the blink and God knows where the blink comes from. But I like to think that um, Siggy would say that it comes out of the unconscious. <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? I, yeah, I've never met somebody who was on, on, on kind of pet name terms with, with Freud. Siggy. <laughs> yes. yes, well, I, I do come from that era in Hollywood where everyone was uh, under the influence of Siggy. And uh, it was a little like going to the gym when I went to Hollywood. In what way? The psychoanalysis. It's like, you know, it, it was something that you did. Possibly a lot of it had to do with um, going beyond the uh, boundaries of American Puritanism. A lot has happened in that time period. These are uh, questions that have been sent in by the listeners. Mark Orr says, how would Senator Bullworth have got on with the current administration in Washington? <laughs> Well, interesting that you bring up Bullworth, because by the time I got around to actually making that movie, I thought, there's no way I can do this without it being a comedy. Well, what Bullworth says in the movie is much closer to things that Bernie Sanders was saying, mm -hmm. rather than what you're calling the current administration. I, I think the answer uh, would be uh, he probably wouldn't have. So. Uh and James Golding, and this is a question I was going yeah. to ask, actually, the last one, but yeah. uh, now we are living in an era of comic book films being hugely successful at yeah. the box office. Is it time for a new Dick Tracy film? Mm -hmm. I was going to ask this because I love Dick Tracy. Thank you. Uh, I feel the same way. What I do feel is that we're in a, a very chaotic period in what David Lean once said to me was the great near art form of the 20th century. I think the last chaos that existed is when we realized that we could, and we realized it in about two weeks, that we, rather than opening a movie in a few theaters and letting it build, we could open in 600 theaters or 700 theaters. That changed the content of movies because people had to get the joke on Friday night, right. everybody or it was a flop or whatever. I think the revolution that we're on the brink of now 
has to do with the fact that we have the freedom to demand that we know what we are going to see. So if we're going to have to get into the car and drive to a theater and park and maybe hire a babysitter, that it's the need to control what we do with our time. And so I would say we're on the verge of movies uh, being treated more like books are treated. And how we deal with that and how we deal with that and not lose the benefits of the big, big screen are going to be interesting. I think that this will be best managed when exhibition, the theater owners, return to participating in the financing of movies as they used to be before what was called the consent decree of the Supreme Court in 1948 that made the motion picture companies get rid of the movie theaters because it was a monopoly. The motion pictures are two hours long now because theater owners financed them and they wanted to sell it twice in one night. When I, I made a a three and a half hour movie, uh, Reds, you know, with an intermission. By the way, the last movie with an intermission. It made half as much money as it could have made if it had played twice in one night. So when I say this is that the theater, when the, when exhibition, the theater owners return to the financing of movies and can make as much money by downloading movies in the home screen as they do in the theaters, then uh, that might be something that will mitigate the effects of the thing that you brought up and are now sorry that you brought up to me, <laughs> uh, which will be the necessity for sequels and tent poles and theme parks and water slides uh, to guarantee that the family will know what they're going to get when they leave the house. I would compare it to what the family now needs to know about restaurants. They, they need to know, they want to go to a place for pizza that they know the pizza will be what they like, rather than to try new pizzas around. Do you feel that I'm talking about movies and pizza simultaneously? It all makes sense to me, but I mean, this is all stuff I'm going to discuss with Siggy later on. <laughs> Well, Siggy, uh, Siggy would be having quite a time right now. <laughs> Siggy would be very, very busy. Uh, so I'm going to take that as a yes to a, another Dick Tracy movie, mainly because I want to see it. But um, uh, let, let me let me pretend to you that I did not hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Beatty, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate. Thank you it. for having me. <laughs>